the big picture, clarity, compassion, courageous love and action. I'm Michael Dowd, and I have been mentored by Joanna Macy for some 30 years. And so my two sermon readings are both from Joanna Macy, from her work that reconnects. This is a dark time filled with suffering and uncertainty. Like living cells in a larger body, it is natural that we feel the trauma of our world. So don't be afraid of the anguish you feel or the anger or fear, because these responses arise from the depth of your caring and the truth of your interconnectedness with all beings. And with respect to the big picture, Joanna Macy says, there is science now to construct the story of the journey we have made on this earth. The story that connects us with all beings. Right now, we need to remember that story, to harvest it and taste it. For we are in a hard time, and it is the knowledge of the bigger story that is going to carry us through. So I offered this as a description of what I would be doing this sermon. No one needs convincing that creation is in crisis, even those with no understanding of the unstoppable nature of biospheric and civilizational collapse feel the stress. Just to read or watch the propaganda formerly known as the news these days is a sobering or unsobering experience. So how do we cope? How can we stay inspired? And perhaps most importantly, how can we be a blessing to others who are confused angry, depressed, or filled with fear, blame, or guilt. So I speak of clarity replacing confusion, compassion replacing blame, shame, and guilt, and courageous love and action. And I like love and action because where does love motivate you to be in action? Replacing fearful activism or desperate hope seeking. Now, the compassion and courageous love and action flow directly from the clarity. So clarity about what? Well, what the big picture, what the epic of evolution or universe story provides is clarity with respect to ecology, history, and human nature. And so that's what I want to just briefly focus on, ecology, history, and human nature, because those three all point to the same thing. And this is painful. We don't want to hear this. Notice yourself. You're, you're going to reject, or at least a piece of you, a part of you, will want to reject what I'm now going to show, which is the unstoppable nature of collapse and the unstoppable nature of denial. So let's take a look at this. First of all, denial often gets a bad rap. Denial is an essential human characteristic. It evolved for very important, very necessary reasons in our psyche. Denial is the largely unconscious habit of thought, whereby we refuse to accept the reality of things that are bad or upsetting, or that challenge our worldview, our legacy, how we live, what is required of us, and or our feelings of self-worth or superiority. Denial is also the instinctual impulse to reject or discount information that calls into question our hopes, assumptions, or expectations about the future. I have denial instincts, you have denial instincts, everybody that we know and love has denial instincts, and so we can have compassion for ourselves and for each other. In fact, denial is often simply adaptive inattention. Stephen Jenkinson says it very prophetically. He says, inattention that is not paying attention to the world's ecological state is well advised because attention to it mitigates against your happiness, your contentment, and your sense of well-being. Having a conscience now is a grief-soaked proposition. Whatever spiritual awakening may have meant in past times and places, if you awaken in our time, you awaken with a sob. Another quote from Stephen Jenkinson, the famous grief walker, he talks about hope-free, hope-free sweet grief, which is grateful, loving sadness that's neither hopeful nor hopeless. He says, grief requires us to know the, the time we're in. The great enemy of grief is hope. Hope is the four-letter word for people who are unwilling to know things for what they are. Our time requires us to be hope-free, to burn through the false choice of being hopeful or hopeless. They are two sides of the same con job. Grief 
is required to proceed. And one more from Joanna Macy, the depth of your grief is the measure of your love. You wouldn't be feeling grief if you weren't in love with life. And of course, most of us are familiar with Kubler-Ross's famous stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance is where we, we, we begin to, to experience the benefits and then trust, which is where we fully experience the benefits of full acceptance. And denial, anger, bargaining, and depression are all doom. <laughs> it's where you're present to the, oh my God, look what we're losing. Look how horrible it is. Acceptance and trust open us up to that place of being hope-free. It's what I call post-doom. The last several years of my life have been devoted to post-doom conversations and resources and all that. I'll say more about that at the very end. And gallows humor is an essential aspect. It's one of the benefits of coming to truly trust. Here's a few examples. So according to your chart, you've been experiencing brief surges of hope followed by prolonged waves of dread. Please note, the post-apocalyptic fiction section has been moved to current affairs. I know you wrote this as a bleak vision of a dystopian future, but today we can sell it as a fond remembrance of the good old days. And I like this one. A few of us are going out after work to pretend it's not the end of the world if you want to join us. So what is it about the big picture? Why is it that it's essential to have a big picture understanding? Well, first of all, this is the single most important book I've ever read in my life, Overshoot, The Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Change by William Catton. And the forward is from Stuart Udall, the uh, former interior secretary. And this is a quote from that. He says, today, humanity is locked into stealing ravenously from the future. That's what this book is about. A major aim is to show that commonly proposed solutions for problems confronting us are actually going to aggravate those problems. In order to truly understand our predicament and not make things worse, we need a clear-headed ecological interpretation of history. And that's what I'm meaning by the big picture, a clear-headed ecological interpretation of history. Now, obviously, I can only touch on a couple of elements in this sermon. But this is a famous quote from Richard Heinberg. Our fundamental problem is not climate change. It is overshoot, of which global warming is a symptom. See, these are the things that activists, we activists, like to focus on, and for great reason. Climate mayhem, death of the oceans, plant and animal extinctions, topsoil poisoning and loss, critical resource depletion, chemical and nuclear wastes, the growing gulf between the rich and the poor, economic instability and insanity, po political polarization and conflict, the contracting of in-groups, the rise of totalitarianism and other isms. These get our attention and for good reason, and yet these are the symptoms. These aren't the problem. They're all symptoms of ecological overshoot, of carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is that we can only take so much from the living world, and there's only we can only exude so much waste before the systems start breaking down. It's known as, as carrying capacity. I call it grace limits. There's a limit to how much we can take and a limit to how much we can exude before we begin losing the grace of the living world. And of course, ecological overshoot is primarily determined by how we define and measure wealth, well-being, and success. If we measure wealth, well-being, and success in human-centered terms, you know, the wealth of kings, the wealth of emperors, the wealth of corporations, nations, whatever, individuals, then that's ecocidal, that's suicidal, that's absolutely crazy. The only sane measure of wealth, well-being, and success and we have thousands of years of examples of this, is life-centered, eco-centric measures. How well is the soil doing decade by decade? How well are the forests doing decade by decade? How are the other species doing decade by decade? What's the carbon in the atmosphere decade by decade? Those are the only sane measures of wealth, well-being, and success. And obviously, industrial civilization is not doing that at all. And these three are already in extinction-level runaway mode. Again, this is painful to hear, but this is the truth. The stability of the biosphere has been in decline for centuries and an unstoppable collapse for decades. This great acceleration of technology and market-driven ecocide is an easily verifiable fact. The scientific evidence is overwhelming. 
Evidence is also compelling that the vast majority of people will deny this, especially those still benefiting from the existing order, those legitimately concerned about the consequences of collapse, and those who fear that accepting reality means giving up. And yes, that paragraph is virtually all of us. The history of more than 80 previous boom and bust, rise and fall societies clearly reveals how and why Homo Colossus is destined for near-term extinction. That's Homo Colossus is William Catton's term for industrial humanity, where each of us in industrial society uses 30 to 50 times the resources and exudes 30 to 50 times the waste of Homo sapiens. And paradoxically, collapse acceptance and collapse trust may be the only thing that can help us not make a bad situation worse, as well as to help us live fully, fearlessly, and meaningfully, even at Teotihuacan. And that's where we are, the end of the world as we know it, Teotihuacan. Make no mistake, that's where we are. It doesn't necessarily mean the end of the world full stop, but it definitely means the end of this set of living arrangements that we've all been used to the last few hundred years. So it turns out collapse is a feature of all human-centered civilizations. There's no counterexamples. In fact, the BBC just a few years ago did a series, Deep Civilization series, where they had an article by Luke Kemp called, Are We on the Road to Civilization Collapse? And of course he answered yes. And he shows this chart with 88 ancient civilizations, just between 3000 BCE and 1000 of the Common Era, just that 4,000 year period. If you go back before 3000 BC, or if you look at the last thousand years, it's well over 100. And as the famous 20th century historian Arnold Toynbee said, great civilizations are not murdered, they take their own lives. And we know how, that's the thing. This is the big picture again, how human centered civilizations commit ecocide or suicide. And this is just, remember, this is just the last 5% of human history, last 8,000 years, roughly 400 generations. Humans have been around for 400,000 years. So we have over 80 examples. And this process typically takes between 225 and 325 years. There's a period of progress, rise, boom. This whole process is overshooting the carrying capacity. It's using more resources and exuding more waste than the systems can bear, but only at the top do we start experiencing the collapse level uh, consequences of that. And then we have regress, fall, bust. And this is an unstoppable process, process of collapse. There's not over 100 examples. And we, know, we don't know of a single example anywhere in human history of any society that's been in collapse, that's been in contraction, because it usually takes many, many decades, that's been able to become sustainable. It can't be done. I do whole programs just on the difference between truly sustainable and faux or fake or delusional, quote unquote, sustainability. But the important thing to think about is our inner feelings, our inner world, our expectations. Because if we're born and we die in times of expansion and times of rise of progress, well, of course, your kids and grandkids are going to have it better than you. You just, you just know that. You know, wealthier, healthier, longer life, all that kind of stuff. At least if you're in the elite or ruling class, not if you're a slave, if in slave civilizations. But if you're born and die in times of fall, in times of regress, in times of bust, well, of course, your kids and grandkids are going to have it more difficult than you. It's just the nature of the times. It's when you're born in times of expansion and it shifts in your lifetime, and that's what every one of us, every one of us on this call is, if we are in denial about this, that's where hope, fear, we bounce back and forth between hope and fear, hope and fear, or we simply resent the fact that we've been, that we've basically been born into this kind of time. So we're either in denial or we experience a sense of doom. Post-doom, that hope-free acceptance, is when we accept that this is the nature of reality and this is the nature of the times in which we have been born. So here's, a, again, a very uncomfortable fact, but we are already two to three decades into abrupt runaway and exponentially accelerating climate, not just climate change, but climate mayhem. And abrupt climate change is like 10,000 years of climate change in half a human lifetime. And, and don't take my word on it. Here's the, the scientists, our best science. All of these, this is the CO2 in the atmosphere from 1960 on, you know, now and, and further. And notice all the cops, COP one, two, three. These are all the conference of the parties. These are all, all our agreements, our pledges, 
Turns out that our summits, our agreements, our promises and pledges are actually worse than meaningless because they give us the delusion that we're making progress when the actual opposite is happening. In the 1960s, carbon parts per million were ra was raising 0.9 parts per million per year. In the 1970s, 1.3 parts per million per year. In the 1980s and 90s, one and a half parts per million per year. In the 2000s, two parts per million per year. In the 2010s, 2.4, and we're already up to 2.6 parts per million per year, and we're only in 2022. And that's just the CO2. If you look at methane and nitrous oxide, what's called CO2 equivalent, like what is the equivalent CO2 in the atmosphere if you add also methane and nitrous oxide, we're already over 500 parts per million. And here's the thing, in May, here's where we are, okay? Now this is the peak glacials. 180 parts per million were when the, you know, the glaciers were thickest uh, and the ice was further south. Ice age average is 200 parts per million. Pre-industrial, which is ideal for agriculture, is 280 parts per million. Agriculture and civilizational collapse become unstoppable at 360. That's why Jane, you know, Jim Hansen put the, you know, 350, Bill McKibben, the whole 350.org was, we had this vision of trying to get down to 350, not just as a good idea, but if we couldn't, we were doomed ultimately. The climate and stability that's needed for agriculture and civilization is this range. And yet we speak about climate change, but as I said, it's abrupt, irreversible and runaway. Here's where we actually are now, 500 plus when you add methane and carbon dioxide. And this is a chart of the last 400,000 years of CO2, global temperature, and sea level rise. And notice how they march in lockstep. Now, sometimes one of them leads, sometimes another one leads, but they all march and fall in lockstep. And we're up here now. So it's not going to be very long before global temperature and sea level rises unbelievably. So here's the really difficult big picture thing that we if, we, if we resist this, if we resent this, if we hate this, if we deny this, well, we're gonna suffer over time. No matter how massive or effective is nonviolent civil disobedience, no matter who or which party is elected into or voted out of public office, no matter how many people change their habits, become vegan, stop flying, no matter how many game-changing, artificial intelligence-driven, high-tech solutions are tried, no matter how many sociopathic CEOs, bankers, and politicians are imprisoned, no matter how aggressively we try to shift to so-called renewables or net zero emissions, and no matter how much evolution of consciousness occurs in the next decade or two, or how many accords, what's pledged to agreed to, or what laws are enacted, no matter what, in other words, these extinction level tipping points are already in the rear view mirror. They're not at risk of passing these tipping points. They're 10 or 20 years behind us already. Loss of the world's ice. The Arctic, Greenland, not just West Antarctica, but it turns out East Antarctica too, just gonna take longer, and mountain glaciers. This is now unstoppable. Methane belching from the permafrost, the methane hydrates and clathrates, that's the deep and shallow oceans, gas and oil wells, that we could potentially, if we cap millions of gas and oil wells, we could you know, limit that amount of methane, but all the rest of it's in runaway mode. Ocean acidification, ocean deoxygenation, that is the loss of oxygen, and at least 25 feet of abrupt nonlinear sea level rise. I had a conversation just yesterday with the former CEO of the Jacques Cousteau Society. And he says 25 to 40 feet is baked in, even if all human beings went extinct tonight. The great burning, the great conflagration of the world's forest is already an out of control. If we could limit emissions, CO2, methane, and carbon dioxide would continue to rise even if all human beings went extinct tonight because the forests of the world are adding all that. The loss of most species, animal and plants, on land, in lakes, rivers, and oceans. And increasingly severe and deadly weather, storms, floods, droughts, hurricanes, and so forth. Well, this kind of says it all. So post-doom, unfortunately, the only way to be in post-doom is to go through doom. You can't avoid doom. You have to feel that, oh, God, before you can get to 
post doom. So post doom, no gloom, gratitude is nearly impossible without a big picture that is an ecological and historical understanding of three things. And this is sort of winding down now. Which actions help and which ones harm? That is, which actions reduce ecological overshoot and which exacerbate or extend ecological overshoot? What is truly out of our control and what we can still potentially start, stop, shift, change, or transform? And then post doom, no gloom gratitude is nearly impossible unless we're clear about this distinction, which is difficult because there's a multi-billion dollar greenwash propaganda campaign keeping us from understanding this. What it's not too late for and what it is too late for. See, people say that, it, it, you know, it's too late. Well, no, it's not too late for some things. Yes, it is too late for some things. I mean, we gotta make that clear. It's not too late for anything and everything that we can do to increase or support or nourish ecological integrity, social coherence and personal wholeness. Those are the three things that every society, healthy society attends to. And it's not too late for anything and everything that we can do to promote ecological integrity, social coherence and personal wholeness. It's not too late to reduce suffering and adapt to what uh, one of my colleagues, John Michael Greer calls less, less energy, less stuff, less stimulation, L-E-S-S. -S. It's not too late to resist further destruction and evil. It's not too late to assist trees and other plants in migrating. This is holy work. Even if we go extinct in the next several decades, this is holy work. In fact, my wife, Connie, is one of the leading point people in North America on this field of assisted migration, assisting trees in migrating faster than any other animal can move its seeds. Like there was a major book that came out that featured her from the very first sentence throughout the book uh, just two years ago, The Journeys of Trees, a story about forests, people in the future. And Robin Wall Kimmerer actually created this term, helping forests walk. If you want to learn more about assisting migration, look at the Wikipedia page on assisted migration of forests in North America. But coming back to the opening reading here, I love this one by Paul Hawken. There's a rabbinical teaching that says, if you're told the world is ending and the Messiah has arrived, first plant a tree, then see if the story is true. And then Robin Wall Kimmerer, I love this quote, action on behalf of life transforms. Because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal, it's not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. So it's not too late for any of that. It's certainly not too late to support indigenous resistance. Every place on the planet where biodiversity and the land and the, the water is being protected most fiercely and most effectively, indigenous peoples are leading that. It's not too late to support that and be engaged in that. It's not too late to engage in all kinds of regenerative love and action. And that can just be building topsoil in your backyard. And it's certainly not too late to be a loving person. It's not too late to be a blessing to friends, family, and community. However, it is too late. And if we don't accept this, we're gonna suffer and cause suffering and misery of people around us. It is too late to slow, stop, or reverse abrupt climate mayhem and the accelerating collapse of the biosphere and business as usual. It is too late to prevent the loss of most of the world's forests, ice, insects, coral reefs, and protective ozone layer. It is too late to spare Homo Colossus the ecocidal consequences of human ingenuity, technology, and the market. And as painful as this is to say, it is too late to prevent billions of humans and other mammals and vertebrates from dying this decade or next. However, when we accept those unacceptable things, when we accept those repulsive truths, there are benefits that are only possible. It's kind of like a person with a terminal diagnosis. There are certain benefits that are only possible if they truly accept that they're going to die. As long as they're in the fight, they don't experience these benefits. So these are the benefits of trusting what is inevitable, of post-doom collapse acceptance. What the title of this sermon is, clarity over confusion, compassion over blame, and love and action over desperation. It helps to reprioritize nearly everything around what matters most 
and what really doesn't. There's a calm urgency to get complete with self, family, others, life, and legacy. It focuses attention on home, family, community, what's local, what's joyful, what's meaningful. There's a freedom from shoulds, oughts, have tos, and freedom for coulds, might, get tos. There's often, almost always, an overwhelming gratitude for the gift of simply being alive, aware, and to feel deeply, including feeling grief. And an expanded sense of identity or sense of self and of impermanence and death as sacred, as holy. So I'd like to conclude these three quotes. Do not lose heart. We were made for these times. Kate Marvel is a climate scientist. We need courage, not hope, to face climate change. Courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. And Chris Martinson, plant a garden, meet your neighbors, practice generosity, learn new skills, control what you can, and leave the rest. <laughs>